If you have your Bible, open your Bible to the book of Zechariah. <clears throat> it's in the Old Testament. And today we're going to start a new series called Big Things Come in Small Packages. And today is part one, and I've subtitled this Unfinished Business. So big things come in small packages. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2. If you're in Matthew, you're too far. So verse 2, he asked me, what do you see? And I answered, I see a gold lamp with a stand with a bowl on top of the seven lamps on it. There are seven spouts for each lamp that is on top of it. <clears throat> now fast forward to verses 6 and 9 of that same chapter. Then he replied, this is the word the Lord spoke to Zerubbabel. Someone say Zerubbabel. You won't succeed by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of armies. So uh, once again, today's title is Big Things Come in Small uh, Packages. Um, I want to, about two weeks ago, my wife and I were in California. And while we're in California, we went to go visit the Steve Jobs childhood home, the home where he grew up in, in uh, Cupertino, California. We can show the picture of that. There it is. Uh, this was the house that he, he grew up in. This was, you notice the garage there. That was a garage where Apple was, the idea for Apple was conceived and was worked on. For those of you who don't know who Steve Jobs is, if you have an iPhone, an iMac, an iPad, he is a creator of that. He forever changed how we would do technology and view the Internet. Now, look at the current Apple campus here today. It's worth, it cost over $5 billion to make. And this is, you can't get in there unless you are an engineer or programmer uh, into the Apple campus the company itself is worth $900 billion here today. So here you have Steve Jobs in the garage getting turned down by many investors. Didn't even have enough money to start out of a, a, a place where he can say it, it was the, uh, a business, a physical place. And, and at one time was sleeping on the floors uh, of his friend's dorms just because he, but he had a vision. He had a vision. It started off very small and it took a long time but imagine if Steve Jobs said you know what I'm starting in a garage uh, I don't think this is going to work out imagine if he quit on the vision that he had for his life just because things started small he would have forfeited the big thing the grand thing that he would eventually birth and give to the earth to the world the technology that we have today he would we would never saw the apple the iPhone, the iPad, had he quit just because things started small and slow. But, but big things come in small packages. And, of course, you see everything that he has accomplished today and, and what he did with his life. And it still continues to shake this earth, the technology that he created. It lives on. And I said that to say this is that maybe you have a vision for your life. See, a vision is not what is. A vision is what is shall be what is yet to happen you know a vision for your life and not everyone's vision is the same maybe you have a vision to get out of debt maybe you have a vision to get your degree maybe you have a vision to start your own business uh, maybe you have a vision to become more spiritual in the things of God or maybe uh, to be the boss at the job you are working at whatever the vision is I want to encourage you Maybe if it's starting small and the progress is slow, I want to tell you, do not quit. Because when you quit, you forfeit the big thing that God wants to bring out of that small start and that slow progress. There's a grand thing. You may have to start in your house. You may have to start with no one helping you. You may have to start by being criticized and often misunderstood. But I want to encourage you, do whatever you got to do. Uh, the, the vision will always stay the same. Change the method. Be flexible. Adapt. But whatever you do, don't quit because big things come out of small packages. And if I could put the text in context here, 
we have Zechariah. The book Zechariah uh, is, written, is named after its author, Zechariah. But the book is not about Zechariah, so to speak. Zechariah is given a vision by God, but the vision is not for him. Zechariah was a prophet. He was also a priest. One of the things that the prophets did in the Old Testament is they would foretell the future of a nation or foretell the future of an individual. Sometimes it was a very gloomy future. You know, in other words, guys, if you, if you don't repent as a nation, God's judgment is going to come and he's going to straighten you out. If you, if you don't change, something bad is going to happen. I'm just telling you what, what, what will happen if there is no repentance. And other times it was very encouraging. And here, God gives Zechariah a vision for Zerubbabel. And the vision was to encourage Zerubbabel, who was discouraged, because the vision that God had gave Zerubbabel was to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple that had been destroyed, that had been neglected. Now, for those of you here who were last week, we talked about Nehemiah. Nehemiah was called to rebuild the walls. Zerubbabel was called to rebuild the temple that was destroyed. So Zerubbabel left Babylon. He's a Jewish, he's Jewish by blood, but he was born in Babylon because of the exile. And God calls him to leave Babylon and to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. But now here's the thing. He had been doing it. He did exactly what God told him to do, but he quit because progress, once again, was coming slow and progress was small. And some people say that when you read Zechariah chapter 4, Zerubbabel had already quit for about 12 to 17 years on what God had told him to do. He already said, you know what, I've had enough of it. Progress is too slow. It's too small. It's not coming as fast as I would want it to come. It's not coming when I want it to come. So I'm just going to quit. And already he had quit on God's vision for about 17 years. And, and what is it that you have quit on? What is it that God told you to do, but because it was coming too slow or progress was real small that maybe you have quit on? But I want to tell somebody here today. See, Zechariah encouraged Zerubbabel. But I believe there's some Zerubbabels in here today. And I want to tell you that you have some unfinished business. See, Zerubbabel, when, when God, see, the vision was awesome because God told Zechariah, tell Zerubbabel. That if he would finish what he started, I already, I already see him completing the building. Tell him if he would finish what he started, that in spite of the criticism and the opposition, tell him that I'm going to be with him. And if God before him, tell him that it's not going to be by his power, by his own might, but by my spirit. He will finish what he started. Tell him that. So I want to tell you that, that if you would finish what you started, God said you, you, you will complete. You will conquer. But there has to be some certain things that you must do in order for this to happen, just like there was for Zerubbabel as well. The first one <clears throat> is always keep the vision that God has given you before you. Always keep the vision that God has given you before you. The first thing that God asked Zechariah, remember Zechariah was to give the vision to Zerubbabel. God tells Zechariah, what do you see in the vision? And let me ask you this. What do you see? Do you even have a vision? Because maybe if you don't have a vision, then maybe you need to go back to start below that and get a vision from God first. Because if you don't have a vision for your life, what is going to happen, you're going to be aiming at everything and hit nothing. You're going to aim at everything and you're going to hit nothing. I want to encourage you, if there is nothing that you see, Helen Keller said, the greatest tragedy is not being born blind. But it's being able to see, but yet have no vision for your life. Right. Helen Keller was blind. But yet she had a vision for her life. And the vision was to help people with disabilities and, and refugees and immigrants to, to empower them. And, and, and I want to tell you, don't, don't, don't look at your disabilities. Don't look at what you lack. Don't look at who is not for you. Don't look at who's not helping you. But if you got a vision, God will give you the provision to finish. So now I want to give you some practical ways that you can keep the vision before you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry if this ain't deep or profound, but these are just some simple ways that you can keep what God has told you to do, what God has showed you. Remember, what is vision? Vision is what shall be. 
It is not what is right now. It's what shall be. What did God show you? What are you looking at? What, is, what did God say about your future? So you have to keep it before you. One of the ways you can do that is you got to write it down. Do you have your vision written down somewhere? I'm not talking about a tattoo. I'm talking about do you have your, your own personal vision statement for your life? You need to write it down. You need to write down what God had told you. Do you declare it? You should be getting up every day, and whatever that vision is, you should be, your soul needs to hear you say what God said for you to do. How are you tracking progress? One thing is to have a vision. Do you have a strategy? So if the goal is to get out of debt, is the goal to become more spiritual, the goal is to rebuild a better marriage, if the goal is to get your degree, then, then the strategy is the roadmap. It's how you're going to get there. How are you tracking progress? You may have a grand vision, but if, 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 how do you know you're progressing or digressing? How do you know if you're this much closer than you were two years ago? If your goal, I'm just giving you an example, is to be more spiritual, how much more are you investing in your personal relationship with God? How much more are you doing for God than you were two years ago? If, if your goal is to get out of debt, and, and that was your goal a couple of years ago. How much closer are you to doing that today? You have to be, whether it be monthly, whether it be weekly, whether it be yearly, how are you tracking and measuring your progress? What does a victory look like? you got to be able to define all that. If, let me give you an example. If you're trying to lose weight, the scale measures your progress will tell you if you are being or what you are doing to achieve that is being effective. If you're trying to get out of debt, your credit report, ay Dios mío, 420 credit. <laughs> you're, it's going to tell you how many accounts are current or not current. It's going to tell you how much your, 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 the total amount of your debt, and it's going to list your different credit scores. It tracks your progress if you're being effective or not effective. So you, this is very important because vision leaks. And this is what I mean by that. Let me use the example. My wife and I, we, every four or five weeks, they come deliver uh, these big old water jugs, and we drink the water from that. We don't drink it from the, the, the tap. But the reason why they come every four or five weeks is because it gets depleted. So the reason why you need to keep your vision before you written, uh, declaring it, tracking your progress is because vision leaks with all the responsibilities and with all the distractions and with all the must commitments like commit, commitments to your kids, to paying bills, to your job, you can easily be depleted of your focus towards that vision. And you just forget about it and you stop working towards it. So another thing is God is very practical but he's also supernatural. The, one, the, one of the most important things that you read in Zechariah is what God tells them. It's not going to be by your own might. It's not going to be by your own manpower. It's going to be by my spirit. And one of the things that God shows in the vision is two trees that are on top of these lamps, these lamps that were burning. Now, keep in mind, these are biblical times. And Zechariah asked, what are those trees? And God says, those are the trees that supply the oil so that, so that the lamps, lamps can keep on burning. And understand that if you are not consistently investing in your relationship with God, in his word and in prayer. See, the prayer and worship and praise and service and the word of God, that's your oil. That's your fuel. And God did not give you the vision for you to burn out. God gave you the vision and giving you his spirit so that you can continually burn for him and achieve what God said for you to do. So you need God's strength. You need the power of the spirit. Isaiah 40, 31 says, those who wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. So the renewing of the eagle, it's interesting that Isaiah uses the eagle as an example because 
an eagle at the age of 25 years old will, will be on the verge of death. So what the eagle will do while it's on the verge of death, it starts uh, declawing itself. It starts pulling out its feathers. It knocks off its beak. And it looks real ugly. It looks like Daffy Duck with his beak shot off. I don't know if you saw the car. <laughs> Uglier than that, I assume. But it, it, it's pelon. It's pelona. You have this eagle that was a beautiful creature, and it looks like it just looks horrible. Now it really looks like it's going to die. But then as time goes on, those claws grow back stronger. As time goes on, those feathers grow back stronger and shinier. As time grows on, that beak grows back, and by the time you know it, that eagle is renewed and it rises up again. And the process may look very ugly right now. The process of you trying to achieve what God told you to do, and, and don't let the process make you quit. Don't let the ugliness make you quit, because I want to tell you, if you'll stick with it, you too, like that eagle, are going to be renewed and rise up and achieve what God said for you to do. Not on your own strength, not by your connections, not by who you know, but through the power of the Holy Ghost, amen. Holy Ghost power, amen. Next one, be faithful in the little. Here's what that means. Give your best at every level that you are at. Even at the small level, you have to give your best effort. You have to give excellence. The Bible says that to, uh, if you are faithful in the little, God will entrust you with much more. You can translate that. If, if you can give your best with little responsibilities, God says, I'll make sure to promote you to greater responsibilities. And you can apply that in the home place, in the church place, in the workplace, in the gym place, in the money place. If you are faithful with the little, God says, I'll promote you. But if some people will, when, when things start to really pick up, then I'll start giving my best. I'll wait till things get bigger, and then I'll start giving my best. God says, it don't work that way. If you're waiting for things to get big, for you to give a bigger commitment, God says, you're going to stay small. But if you can give a big old commitment at a small level in slow progress, God said, I'll promote you to much. And, and, and we can go all day, you know, you want to be the boss at work, but you don't show up on time. You, you, want, you want more responsibilities, but the little ones they give you at your job, you never, you never do them right. I want to have a lot I want God to move in my finances, but yet you have the tithe and your offering that you already have, but you're not faithful in that. How will God, God said, I'm not going to give you more if you can't be faithful to the little that you have. I want to be a preacher, but you don't pray or serve. I, I want to be a leader, but you, you, never, you, you never show up. God's not interested in your capability. You can be very capable, be very gifted, but if you don't show up, God's looking at your availability. If you can be faithful in the little, God says, I'll promote you to much. The next one is you, there's, there must be a willingness to lay stepping stones before you can lay the capstone. And Zechariah... God told Zechariah, remember, Zechariah gets a vision, but the vision's not for him because Zechariah is a prophet, foretells the future, but the vision is for Zechariah to trans translate it to Zerubbabel. But God said, tell Zerubbabel, I already see him laying the capstone, the main foundation, the main rock, the completion of the temple. And that's all good, but before you can lay capstones, you must be willing to lay some stepping stones. And let me use what... And what, this is what I mean by that. Sometimes you have to do things that you don't want to do to get you to the place to where you can do what you are called to do. Sometimes you have to do things that you don't want to do to eventually get you to the place so for you to be in a position to do what you are called and created to do. Sometimes you got to be in a position that you may be too gifted to be in that position. And, and that's not really where God wants you to be. But God says, before I get you to the next position, I'm going to build your character and your faith in this position. And even though that's not where I want you, it's building you for where I've called you to be. So you be faithful to that. I've never 
wanted to be, a, I used to be a claims adjuster before uh, I started Elevate Ministries. I never wanted to be a claims adjuster in my life. You know, I was in the banking industry before that, but God gave me a vision. And the vision that God gave me, I, I could not go to school full time where I was currently working at before. So I had to work nights for about seven and a half years. To this day, my sleeping patterns are destroyed. You, you know, I'll, sometimes I wake, I have a hard time sleeping. But I had to work nights on Sundays. I would work on Sundays too, but the thing was I would go to church, and then after church I would be at my job by 1230, and then I wouldn't come home to around 230 at night. I did this for seven and a half years. And back in my day, church services were no hour. They're about three hours long. Y'all remember the old school church services, amen? And I would go all tired. So one time on my break, I fell asleep and I woke up and it was nighttime. And my boss said, where'd you go? Did you drive to El Paso or something? But I did that for seven and a half years. I didn't want to be an adjuster. But you know what? They were paying for my college. They are helping me with my college. They're helping me pay my bills. I was at a place I didn't want to be, but I was faithful in that place that I didn't want to be to eventually God took me to where he called me to be. And you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I'm too smart for this. I'm too good looking for this. This is above me. Uh, I'm, uh, this is below me. But guess what? God could be using that place to prepare you for the great next promotion that he wants to take you. And God says, I ain't going to take you here if you can't be faithful there. You must be willing to see the vision come to pass. Be faithful to the vision, even if it takes a long time. Here's where I lost all of y'all right now. Because no one likes to wait, including myself. Especially with the power of technology nowadays. I mean, we get instant, we don't have to wait. In my day growing up, me and my grandma watched watch Case at 12 at 5 o'clock. And Channel 4 and Chris Maru and then the Spanish news after that on Channel 41. <laughs> or we would have to wait to a certain time for me and my mom to watch the novelas. Yes, I would watch them with her. <laughs> but nowadays, you don't have to wait for anything. If someone dies or something happens, immediately you can get access to that news on social media. There's no more waiting. You don't have to physically see a person, wait till, you know, Wednesday to go physically. See. You can see them on FaceTime. Or whatever it is. Nobody likes to wait anymore. They can deliver your food. They, they, there's so many different things. But I want to tell you, that's not how God sometimes work, works. Sometimes you got to wait. Well, how's that? Well, Jesus waited 33 years before he could accomplish God's vision for his life. How did that happen? Joseph waited 12 years from the time he was thrown in the pit to God eventually promoting him to the palace. King David, from the time he was anointed as a little kid and told him that he would be king over Israel, waited 15 years. Abraham, when he told that he would have a kid at an old age, well, he waited a long time. <laughs> the thing is, you have to be willing to wait. You cannot do things wrong for years and then because you said a prayer, uh, you think things are going to change overnight. You can't do things wrong. You can't neglect something like they were neglecting the temple for months or even years. And because you said a prayer and quoted a scripture and got John 3.16 tattooed on your back, that things are going to change in a couple of hours. Now, I'm not saying that God cannot do that. Because, once again, the scripture, the scripture is practical, but it's also supernatural. I'm not saying that what took years, God can do in months. And what took months, God can do in days. And what took days, God can do in minutes. And God can do all that. But a lot of times, most of the time, you're going to have to wait. And, and understand, if you're not willing to wait, you can forfeit from unwrapping the, the grand big thing that God is doing with that small start and that slow progress. Amen. So you must be willing to wait. The last one is there has to be sacrifice. And now, people, when you say there has to be sacrifice, there, there, there is a fad that is unbiblical and unscriptural that says that Christians don't need to do, you know, we're exempt from putting in hard work. 
We're exempt from actions. All we got to do is just quote scriptures and just pray, and, 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 and some unicorn's going to come sprinkle pixie dust, and everything's going to come together. There's no responsibility on our part. There's no accountability on our part. Guess what? God doesn't just give us responsibility. He gives us accountability. We are not exempt just because we are carrying the Holy Spirit. As far as there is no works, that's about our salvation. Jesus did all the works. But Jesus did not fill you with the Holy Ghost for you to look pretty. If you are pretty and or handsome, that's cool. Or ugly, it don't matter. <laughs> See, but God has filled you with his spirit for you to accomplish his purpose and the vision that God has given you. God wants to do a grand thing, but if it's going to happen, there gots to be sacrifice. Yes, I just said gots. <laughs> There can be no glory without sacrifice. You must be willing to get yourself uncomfortable emotionally, financially, physically, if you are going to see the vision come to pass. Let me give you an example. My wife and I, while we were still dating, at the age of 19, we prayed about it, and God gave us a vision as boyfriend and girlfriend. And our vision was we were going to get married debt-free. And we were going to get married uh, with all our education, or the majority of all our education, I said education, uh, uh, the majority of our education out of the way. Sounds cool, right? Sounds like a nice dream. There was a lot of sacrifice. There was a lot of un sacrifice financially, emotionally, physically, because it didn't, ha it, it didn't happen in one or two years. It didn't even happen in five years. It took us eight years. For me, it took me a long time to get my education. I'm a little bit slow. My wife, on the other hand, is, a, is an overachiever. But to pay off the debt, we saw couples. We never went anywhere while we were still dating. They were here and there, but the majority of the time we were either. See, this was, our, this was our priorities. God first, our families our church, because we're both active in ministry. And now, once again, I'm not saying that our journey has to be your journey. doesn't matter if your journey is different than our journey, but the principles are universal. The, the principles of sacrifice, I don't care if it's your journey to lose weight or get out of debt, it applies in the same situation or become more spiritual. The, the same principles still apply. And it took us eight years to do that now. Once again, in Latino years, we might as well have been a grandma and a grandpa getting married and being together eight years. And then you know Latinas and Latino moms and grandmas, how come you're not married yet? And how everyone's asking, and when's this, and when's that going to happen? My friends do, you can be straight up with me, do you really like girls? <laughs> Is there something you're hiding? <laughs> Is it eight years? You have a beautiful girlfriend, and you haven't asked her to marry you yet. And you can all, almost picture how ridiculous I sounded. Well, we have a vision from God. We're going we're to get our education out of the way and, and get be debt free. Be, because we, we wanted to go in there with some, some stability. But there were, there were days where we saw couples going out, not caring about what was going to happen, being very uh, 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 just lacking discipline. And we were there working our homework assignments, and, and, and when we had time off, we are serving at church. But let me tell you something. At the end of those eight years, when, when we finally tied the knot, we, we're debt-free, praise the Lord, amen, and we had our education out of the way. But that none of that could happen had we were not willing to delay uh, instant gratification for long-term success. It did not just happen. I wish it could tell you. And, and not only that, but we waited. We waited. There, it, it, there were so many times we wanted to give up. And there were so, at one time, she was even living in Washington, D.C. to finish her education. It was very tough. It was not easy. But let me tell you something. Sometimes motivation is overrated. 
Oh, I got to feel motivated to do what God has called me to do. I got to feel inspired to do what God has called me to do. No, you don't, because if you live long enough and if you actually pursue a vision, there are going to be times where you're not motivated, where you just feel like throwing in a towel, cussing, upset, mad, angry, frustrated. But when motivation runs out, discipline kicks in. You can't just be motivated. You can't just always be looking for some TED Talk or some YouTube video to pump you up. Paul, <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a disciplined mind and of power. So that even when you lose strength, God's strength kicks in. So even when there is no motivation, the, the, the Holy Spirit and you discipline yourselves keeps you going and going and going and going. I want to end with this. Zerubbabel, his name means sown in Babylon, but a stranger to Babylon. Zerubbabel was Jewish, but he was not born in Jerusalem because of the exile. He was taken to a foreign land. And the reason why his parents named him that was prophetic, because he would never feel comfortable in Babylon. He would always feel like a stranger towards their values towards what they believed in because he was destined to live and rebuild in Jerusalem. And I want to tell you, see, Babylon represents your depression. Rap Babylon represents your past achievements. Babylon represents uh, 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 things that you have tried to do but, but you failed at. And the reason why you are uncomfortable with your past achievements, the reason why you are uncomfortable in your depression and in your failure is because though you were created for those things to be strangers to you, not your friends, not be in a relationship. Am I making sense here? Didn't your mama ever tell you don't talk to strangers? There is a reason why you don't feel comfortable with what you've done in the past. There is a reason why you don't feel comfortable in your depression. There is a reason why you don't feel comfortable with your failures. Because they are not your friends. You are a stranger to them. You are a danger to strangers. Let me tell you who is your friend. Jesus says, I call you friends. He's not just a friend. He's a provider. He is no stranger. He is your savior. He is no stranger. He is the one that will give you the peace that passes all understanding. He is no stranger. He will give you the strength when your faith has been dropped to the ground and kicked on the ground. God will give you the power. God will give you the grace. Stand to your feet. Stop talking to strangers. Start talking to your friend. He's going to make big come out of your small. A big change is coming to your small progress. A big blessing is coming to your small provision. God is about to turn small faith into big faith. Zechariah, not Zerubbabel, means God remembers. People may have forgot about you. But God still remembers you. You may have forgot and lost focus over what God told you to do. But God has sent me here with this word to remind you what he has called you to do. When, Zechari when Zerubbabel is getting this message downloaded into his spirit from Zechariah, 17 years he already had quit on God. And Zechariah says, look, I know you're discouraged. I know you've thrown in a towel, but you still have some unfinished business. Zerubbabel, it's time for you to get up and go back and finish what you have started. You are not a quitter. You are a conqueror. You are not a victim, but you are a victor. Get up out of your mediocrity. Get up out of your depression. Get up out of your, your failure and go back and finish what you started. And guess what? Zerubbabel finished what he started. He rebuilt the temple. He rebuilt the temple. And today, we're going to have, uh, we did it in the first service, and we're going to do it this service. And if you said you have, I believe we're going to do an altar call. But I believe there's some Zerubbabel's in here. You do have a vision. But you stop working towards that vision. And you're discouraged for whatever reason. 
And for those of you here, God wants to encourage you today. He's not going to erase the problems that you have to confront. He's not going he, to keep you from facing those mountains, but he's going to give you the power and the faith to overcome those mountains. But you're like Zerubbabel, you're discouraged, but God says, Zerubbabel, you got some unfinished business. And there's some, I, I believe that everybody, if you say you have a vision, should be at this altar call. Because if you have a vision, can we all just be real? We all get discouraged at times. And we all need the encouragement and the wind of the Holy Spirit to breathe into us to keep on going again.